Hey, how's it going, everybody? Now we're moving on to the third stage of the three different uh, angelic or supernatural incursions into man's history. And uh, we just finished talking about the flood. We've talked about the Nephilim. We've talked about the Nakash, the shining one who tempted humanity was at the beginning. And so now we're I'm going to make the transition here, but I want to... Um, I want to look at uh, Genesis 9 and uh, what happened, you know, when Noah comes out of the ark. And again, he's given the command right at the beginning, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And, he, and then God says, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and upon everything that creeps on the ground and all fish in the sea. And into your hand I've delivered them. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you, and as I gave you green plants, I give you everything. But you should not need the fresh with life, and that is its blood. And your life probably required for every beast and requirement for man. As fellow man, I will require reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you be fruitful and multiply, and increase greatly on the earth and the multiplying it. So again, same old problem, you know, where was the first murder, you know, Cain killing Abel, they're creating image and likeness, God is in the process of um, uh, beginning things again, and he's got uh, himself, uh, people, eight people that were on the boat, and uh, Noah's the patriarch or the leader, the chosen one at this point to rule over the world and be the interceder, the prayer, the prayer and priest as well as king, as well as prophet. He's uh, looking at understanding in the mediator of past, present knowledge on into the future to his children and his, his sons, and then they're supposed to pass on to their sons' sons. But, you know, as, you, as we know, there's the serpent seed that gets tempted. You know, the tempting goes on all throughout our history. And that's why the story never stops, it, you know, or continues in the same trajectory till its ultimate destination when finally the serpent seed gets crushed. And so um, on the other side as well, the situation with the uh, rainbow covenant that God made with the creation, and he says, I'm not going to destroy the world by flood again. And uh, he has a sign in the sky, and that's what we know as the rainbow. And, you know, most cultures have this story about the rainbow. But what people don't realize about what that bow is, you know, if, if it's, um, you know, we think of a bow and uh, it's a weapon. And what that's saying is the bow is pointed upwards towards the sky. And so what that's saying is that if God breaks his covenant with the creation and uh, in bringing water judgment, you know, he's saying, you know, I'm not God and let me be destroyed. But, you know, he is God. He's not going to be destroyed. But that's a covenant faithful reminder to us and his character that the creation is continued even now, like when you try and tell people that we're coming to the next epoch in transition in world history, like, you know, well, no, it's not going to happen because everything happens as it always happens. And it's like, nothing has changed. You know, we get through this disaster, that disaster, and, and people still keep living. And, you know, this is part of the problem. So, you know, again, the history goes in, in cycles and and that's what prophecy is. The problem with our, our Western mindset is we think like Greeks and Greeks, their idea of prophecy was prediction fulfillment. And, uh, that's a part of it, but that's not the whole of it. Like the the part of the problem is, is that uh, you get told what, but you don't get told when. And in the Hebrew mindset, or the or the uh, the uh, ancient Near East or whatever, this idea is that it's 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 a pattern, and so you have these repetitions of pattern till they move towards a consummation where the final uh, outcome is actually happened. And all these things that we're pointing to the end result are precursors or foreshadowing of the ultimate fulfillment of things, you know, both for positive and negative. It's not just all negative. It's it's all it's actually it ends up all positive. And so that this is how you destroy the negative or evil. And so now we're at a situation here where, you know, again, the same command, be fruitful, multiply, you know, and, and their job is to replenish the earth. And they're supposed to be this priesthood people continuing to, you know, make the creation beautiful and have dominion over it. And part of that is they're supposed to be in relationship with their creator. 
you know, and, and it started again with a small group of people, but how, how it didn't take very long for it to go south, you know, again, because these fallen angels are working in the, in the backdrop to try and tempt men, and that's why the curse on uh, Ham and Canaan come in, but uh, you don't realize what it means because it's a prophecy, and then you see what happens, who are the first ones who lord over men and establish their uh, dominions and establish their empires, and here you have the continuity that... Uh, Part of the background of the story as well is that uh, part of, part of uh, Ham's line, uh, Canaan and, and these other groups uh, that end up rebelling and getting caught up in idolatry and witchcraft, they discovered a ancient uh, artifact there that gave them all kinds of knowledge of what was happening on before the flood to do with witchcraft and magic and science and technology. And they used this knowledge in order to uh, establish their, their kingdoms and start lording over people and that again was never the the purpose i know and, and so now this this change that happens right now in this section of the story is when now instead of just being families people get identified as particular nations and they're identified as nations over particular areas of geography you know this was a development that you see going on here in the story and this was all precipitated by two things one, the Tower of Babel, and two, the, uh, in, the given over of these nations to other Elohim, lesser quote-unquote deities or lesser gods to rule over and mediate the knowledge from the Most High God, Yahweh, to the nations. And Israel in Genesis 12 is, begins with Abraham, a particular people starting with one man. Again, so, again, you've got these patterns of recreation stories, so you're starting with one man. And that's, you know, the other nations in the list of the nations in Genesis 10 are the nations that are current, you know, the progenitors of the nations that we live in right now. And the nations that they're named at according to the different prophecies and corrections and judgments and, and promises. And so, but the most important thing that we need to understand what, what the Tower of Babel was about. I want you to recognize that uh, you notice that... Um, Abel and Cain brought their offerings, you know, so Cain brought a proper offering. He offered the first fruits of his flock, you know, and then you see the next section. Um, you see uh, Noah, when he comes out of the boat, he has an offering and he makes an altar. You notice that there's no temple. There's no temple. And because, again, that goes back to the understanding that we're the representatives of the deity. What the ancient Near Eastern people used to do was they used to build the a cosmic uh, uh, symbolic representation of of everything the universe and that would be what the temple was representing where the deity dwelt in it and then they would put an image of the deity in the temple and that's uh, was the representation of the cosmic reality and the gateway or the portal or the door um, to interact with the uh, beyond the supernatural or the invisible realm but that's not what's going on all throughout the people that know what's going on. They understand that they are themselves a representation. There is no image. We are the image and likeness of God. And we're the ones given the power, but we've been deceived and been misled to by these other thugs that are bigger than us and lie to us and deceive us. And they're continuing to move their plan forward with all the meanings that they've deceived. And what what the, um, the Tower of Babel was, was a interaction with the supernatural realm, a, a gateway, a portal, a door, so that these creatures could actually manifest their kingdom in this realm and counterfeit what actually is going on in the realm beyond that. There's a real temple, but it's not in this realm because the, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to explain, but the, the nature in which we live in, everything is temporary. And we talk about the life of the blood and the blood being shed and you shed man's blood, you know, what's going to be required of him. Because we, we, we have to have blood in order to live. We're physical creatures that have a flesh sack that is connected with a spirit. And the flesh sack and the spirit make up the soul. That man was made a living soul. And so that's how you have your being. Once your soul departs, that's the, the breaking up of the physical manifestation of your flesh sack connected with your spirit. Your soul cannot function. You know, but once once those two things break apart, your spirit goes back to God and returns to dust, like it says there, or you go to Sheol, or, or now 
uh, since the resurrection, those are righteous go to uh, the third heavens, and those who are unrighteous are waiting in in, uh, in Sheol uh, for their judgment uh, at the last great day. But again, like people uh, lost a lot of understanding about how all this stuff works and what man is, and um, we've invented a lot of a lot of nonsense, uh, you know, uh, mythological stories, you know, and I use it in like, some context of our modern way of our stories that aren't true, st stories that are fabricated, stories that are made up to somehow explain things away, but don't explain anything, you know, and so that was what was so dangerous. And so this sets up the context of the cosmic battle that hasn't changed, that the uh, goyim or the nations are every creature and person that is under the nation's that are described in Genesis 10. And now at Genesis 12, you have the uh, making up of the chosen one uh, through which the nations of the world will be blessed through the one seed that will come through that would defeat um, all of uh, our enemies. And at this time, we don't know, but as you read through the story, well, the Hebraic line through Abraham, he eventually, he was called out of that realm. So he's one of us, but yet different from us. You know, again, these types and patterns, you know, and through his line came the household of Israel and through the household of Israel came the priesthood line with Levi. And there was a temple set up and now it's it's and a king set up and now it's 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 masquerading everything that the fallen angels have set up on all the other Gentile nations. You know, because there was a point there where Israel never had a king. So they had to argue to get a king through Saul and that uh, they never had a direct priesthood other than the order of Melchizedek. And it was one person that had the order that was a leader, prophet, king, and priest that had knowledge and they passed their testaments on into the future to the next generation that would be faithful and they were told what God was doing and what the intention was, even though they didn't know how it was going to be fulfilled. They were told what, but they were never told exactly when. And then once things actually happened, then they recognized the fulfillment and they, you know, see how the stages are moving forward. You know, and so through the righteous line of the king, you know, became Judah and then David was the faithful one in whom everyone is typed and their idea of Messiah was not just a king but it was a king who was also a priest who is Melchizedek and we haven't got to that there in, in uh, was it, I think it's chapter 13 where, where Melchizedek makes his, his appearance on the, on the scene but what all that means and so there's a lot of these stories where they're setting the foundation for you to understand and be aware of how these things interact and interplay and again, there's other books that explain more information in the backdrop, whether it's Jasser or Jubilees or Enoch or some of the other uh, works. And and as you move forward with the nations, even uh, this is where the idea in the New Testament where you have powers and principalities and uh, where we have overlords over the Gentiles. And that's who had them enslaved and they mediated knowledge of the supernatural to the realm. And what was supposed to happen is that Israel was supposed to fulfill its calling as a priesthood people with Yahweh as their God, and they were supposed to have a covenant, and they were supposed to have laws that were so righteous, and this, that, and the other thing, that the other nations would want to um, uh, follow them, and that these other Elohim angels would mediate this knowledge, and that they would help encourage the process of them following Yahweh. But that's not what happened. Israel wasn't obedient through their um, temptation to be involved in idolatry and still you know, when they were taken out of Egypt, they had a very difficult time uh, restructuring their whole identity because even if all the miracles and all the wonders and signs that they seen, uh, that generation never made it out to the promised land that they came out and they started grumbling, complaining. They thought being a slave and, and eating garlic and leeks was, was a better life, working daily as slaves for their taskmasters and being free. They couldn't handle it and they couldn't handle the requirements that the living God had uh, placed upon them to be faithful and, and not be tempted to go back and worship these foreign idols and, and continue to practice these things that were an offense or abomination to their creator and their God who delivered them from the nation of Israel with a strong arm. So this is where we're going to, but I want to um, quote a couple things here to help set the context. And Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. See, this is the background that the ancient Greeks and, you know, Greeks representing all the Gentile nations, they're aware of this stuff. That uh, And so this is Deuteronomy 32, 8. 
when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, and when he divided mankind, this is talking about Genesis uh, 10 with the, ta the uh, table of nations at the end result of the, them rebelling at the uh, Tower of Babel when he came down to check things out and he gave them languages. All this stuff was preordained. He already knew what they were going to do and he gave them languages. And, and that's why you have all these different stories told over and over again in different languages, sort of repeating the same thing. And then, you know, now, now they're trying to say, oh, like all these different Canaanites and Babylonian and Persian and all these other religions are, you know, they're, they're the original story and the Bible isn't and Jesus is just a copy of all these other things. And they, they go off on Egyptian mythology and all this other nonsense, but this is where all this stuff comes from that Satan and, and, uh, continue to keep the mythology going through idolatry and when the most i gave the nations their inheritance and he fixed the borders of the peoples and according to the numbers of the sons of god that's the 70 nations that are described in genesis 10 and that's you know until you understand that you don't realize how this all works and then what and how these evil rulers came over us because once the um they weren't very successful at uh getting uh, people to uh, respond because of Israel's uh, oh, disobedience. They just set themselves up as the deities of the nations and they started their own pagan religions and continued things on that they sold humanity out just like some of the other fallen angels desired to rule over us or to kill us or to load over us and make us their slaves. Then that's where all this stuff comes from. And so the, the, again, you've got these two groups with the seed of Satan or the seed of the serpent and you've got the seed of uh, the woman that has to come forth and crush the serpent. And, and this is where the story gets set up and this is how it all interplays. And so now as we're getting past the preamble, the story in, in Genesis 13 focuses on the priesthood family through which the Redeemer is going to come through and how it's all going to move forward to fulfillment. And the now the battle lines are being drawn. You know, and so this is this is what was so significant. So, and this is what the arrogance where Israel in itself comes from that they were the chosen people in the sense that they were it was preordained that there would they would be set apart. You know, separated. That's what holiness means. It just means set apart or separated for a particular purpose. But they never fulfilled their particular purpose except one, and that was the whole point. That that was the one thing that Satan could not control. He had no idea that the second person of the trinity the son would become a man and he would be both god and man and there be a place and a time now that he would never choose to undo that that god's able to do anything and he can do things new within his own beings taking up our humanity and, and became man through the son in the presence of the father by the spirit and now eternally he is this way and this is how the whole creation with man as the primary goal to generate uh, Creatures like us to be prepared to be eternal and immortal and to be righteous and to be uh, given capacity to live forever and to rule over the creation properly as priestly kings. This is fulfilled and begun in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension, and then the descending of the Holy Spirit to the called out ones, the ecclesia, to uh, recreate them to become sons of God. That we're replacing these sons of God that are ruling over the nations right now and their time of judgments coming that they're bringing us to the press of blessed cloth to total annihilation and that's what their intention was but you know god's not going to let it totally destroy everybody and again he has the capacity to recreate and he also has the capacity to revive you know so even though these times that are coming upon us are going to be terrible for a lot of us and most of us there's still the hope and that's actually what the church has been trying to um announce to people and uh to help people to get ready for the second coming and uh this is what i've been trying to do is just you know try and in a sensible way in a logical way in an orderly way try and present the material to you so you understand how prophecy works and where it's going to and, and what it's about and what the goal is you know and the when is not this now point that i just passed by but the now is a lot closer than what we realize. And that now is what the Bible calls uh, the time of Jacob's trouble or the, the latter times. And this is where a lot of the physical history of, of the land and the peoples on the land gets restructured and reorientated. And the cosmic battle of 
a Megiddo their uh, Armageddon, you know, Armageddon, you know, which gets translated as Armageddon, which isn't necessarily, it's that plane, it's a mountain, and it's representing the government of Satan versus the government of Jacob's God, Israel, uh, Yahweh, the Most High God, and the confrontation where who's go whose children are going to rule the world, you know, and, and Israel and the church represent Adam's children, and uh, the fallen ones have their own seed, like you read in Enoch where they wanted to establish their own kingdom and totally usurp us and parody what God has in mind. But all this stuff is coming to an end in that there are a lot of these creatures that are amongst us and embody us and they're called tares amongst the wheat or goat amongst the sheep and they can't repent. And that's why, again, like the evil cannot be stopped. <coughs> Excuse me. They have no governor to stop their evil. And so a lot of problems people are having now is that they're recognizing this evil and they thought, well, how the fuck can these people do this? You know, the one, they're not people. They're they're imposters, they're clones, or they're Nephilim, or they're shapeshifters, or you know, I, I don't really have the language to explain it, but and when it's once it's made manifest and you understand what those creatures are, you realize, yeah, they're not our friends, they're here to destroy us. And they're and they're trying to look like us, imitate us. Because they want to replace us, but they're not, they already know that they've lost. And so, what they're trying to do is entice as many people as they can to follow them to the brink of destruction and be thrown in the lake of fire for their rebellion against the Most High and the rejection of their Savior, both Creator and Savior, you know. And, and so, this is what the challenge is. And so, you know, as I see the need, I'll, I'll bring back these, these stories. But now we're going to focus in the next stage here you know, how the redeeming comes who and who the redeemer is and why he's the redeemer and what this means for the future. You know, once you understand that and you understand the history where we come from, you know, it's a solid foundation which which we believe in. And we don't believe mythology or lies or fable stories like Peter says. You know, and, and part of the challenge is that uh, the difference between you and me or the unbeliever and the believer is that we have the Holy Spirit which actually gives us a new nature so that we can stand outside our former life and actually look at our lives and see what the value it is. And we recognize that we're a sinner and deserve death. And yet, through the mercy and belief that God forgives, it gives us a new mind through rebirth of the Holy Spirit. And it transforms us so we can change our character and that we actually have the capacity to see things and understand things from a different perspective. From God's perspective, not that we represent or can ever substitute for his mind and for his creative power. But we have awareness, you know, through revelation and but it's not a complete knowledge because obviously we're not God. We're, we're, we're poor substitutes in many ways, you know, for the Savior and we're poor <laughs> representatives of the Savior because as much as we strive, we will never be like him until we see him as he is and we'll be transformed to be like him. But that's going to happen at the new creation at his second coming. And so we're in the middle of the times. And so, you know, the one thing that most people don't realize and, and um, you know, in many ways, everybody is right. Like, you know, the church is hypocritical. You know, but what that means is, is that we're play actors and, and that you catch us in our authenticity. And that's the whole point of what forgiveness is about. That's the one thing people don't understand is that there's never going to be a time or place where I won't sin or won't make a mistake or do something in the wrong attitude or, or the wrong spirit, you know, because I'm still, you know, the old man, as, as we the language we use in the New Testament. But the thing that keeps it going is that we know that we can be forgiven. But some of this crazy stuff where people are taking advantage of other people and making it a lifestyle to uh, prey on grace or whatever, like those people are going to be judged very harshly, you know, because once you understand who God is and what he's done for you, you need to make changes in your life and become part of the of the solution, not to continue on the problem and say, well, it was me. I can't change. Like, no, you can change. And that's actually what makes the difference. And, you know, I, I, for my life, like it's, it's been a struggle, but it's been, the best experiences I've ever had. Like I've experienced so many crazy things and met so many interesting people and uh, uh, being aware of so many interesting realities and, and things and thoughts and stuff. And so, you know, you won't start there. You have to work at it. And so, you know, I encourage people to look at the times and the seasons and recognize what's going on and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you know, and, you know, and, and, uh, you know, start taking the Bible seriously, and there's all kinds of information out there, whether it's Mike Heiser's work with the Naked Bible podcast, or Ken Johnson has a lot of his stuff with the the um, uh, his his Dead Sea Scroll work, or 
a lot of other, you know, like I like Chuck Misler and some of these other guys from the uh, Jesus movement there in California. Not everybody's perfect, but you can get a better understanding anyways, you know. These are three groups of organizations or people that I trust and I've learned a lot. And, you know, well, one one of them was my friend, but he died. And, and the other one I knew, and and uh, but he died. And, and now the, uh, you know, the, the only one doing contemporary work is Ken Johnson, but he's doing really good stuff on the Dead Sea Scrolls and helping us understand the times in the Second Temple Judaism stuff when Jesus came on the scene and how the prophecies were fulfilled and it's getting become a lot more clear and the reason why all this knowledge is coming out is to get ready Israel you know so the last thing I'm going to read is from Revelation Revelation 10 and uh, the reason why I'm reading this is because uh, this is the whole point you know so I'll, I'll read uh, Revelation 10 10 and then and it ends in, in verse 11 and I took the little scroll uh, from the hand of the angel and ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach had been made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many people's nation, language, and kings. You know, and so this prophecy about many people's nation, uh, languages, and kings, that all comes from Genesis 10. It's It's to all the Gentile nations so that they can... The only thing that's holding back history right now is that there's a certain number of Gentiles from these nations that need to be saved to be ready to be prepared for the leadership group that's going to uh, help restore and, and, and be the people that are involved with the uh, recreation, leadership of the recreation and the new creation. And so once that's done, then history is going to shift. And God's going to focus so that all of Israel is going to be saved. And this is where all the wars and the judgments and all kinds of supernatural knowledge is going to uh, be made manifest, even though people won't necessarily recognize it per se. But uh, this is what's coming. And uh, this is where, you know, you, you need to understand that you can't uh, sit on the fence anymore. You either got to choose Yahweh and his Messiah that he's provided for you. Just like Abraham, you know, where he goes to Isaac, he says, well, where is the sacrifice? And he goes to Isaac, the Lord will provide, you know, and then this is before they're going to walk on to Mount Moriah before he, uh, you know, he's told to sacrifice Isaac. And, and that's not exactly what happened. And again, like the Lord did provide, he provided the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And so this is part of our challenge. And so, you, you know, you have to believe, you know, and the other option is you take the mark. And if you take the mark, it's going to de determine and deface your uh, your uh, humanity so that you're no longer in the image. And that's why you'll be directly connected to the beast. And uh, you're going to be thrown like a fire when they're judged and destroyed here. You know, their kingdom is only going to last three and a half years, you know. So for all the bullshit and hyperbole, they used to talk about a kingdom for a thousand years. Well, they don't have the power or authority to do that. Only God does, and he's giving it to his people. And we don't take it by force. It's given to us, you know, and it's part of the new creation and the place in which righteousness dwells and which is going to be no sin. And so, you know, it's it's a uh, it's a far better promise than the chaos that's coming on the scenes right now, you know, and the dread that everybody lives with. Like, you know, you know, I, I wish people could understand everything I did, and I wish I could understand even more, man, because once you understand the stuff, it's addictive. Like, I just... I, I, I enjoy studying to learn more and so a lot of other people study, you know, and, and I, I gather and collect, you know, I join the dots and to, uh, to get the picture put together on, on, on the, on the depth level, as well as the, uh, the, the span, you know, the width level, you know, because it's something that you need to be able to see because what's coming is, is both good news and the worst time ever. And so, if you're on the right side, you'll be protected. Even to be set free and to die, you know, is, is you know, that you've got a redeemer and a savior waiting on the side and you won't die. You're going to be given your reward and the crown that comes with it, you know. And so there's so many things that I have to say, but, you know, I only have so much time, but I'm going to, again, pace it out for everybody. And, and uh, you know, and somewhere along the line here, once I get to Melchizedek, I'll, I'll probably do a, an addendum and, and or an excursus and, and and get to the point of the end well 
the Lord's Supper Society, why why name my channel that, and what what the Lord's Supper is, and uh, and the society that holds it together at the Agape Feast. So, well, all that stuff is coming. But uh, again, you know, God be with you, and uh, for those you know few people that listen or watch, like you know, I hope that you can take this knowledge and and be benefited by it and be blessed by it. So, thank you. Amen.